It's my honor now to introduce our dinner speaker tonight. Governor Jan Brewer became the governor of Arizona in 2009 when Janet Napolitano resigned to become... <laughs> I'm with you. She resigned to become President Obama's Secretary of Homeland Security. <laughs> now that's what I call a change for the better for Arizona. She's got a wonderful book here, and Governor Sarah Palin wrote the foreword to this book. It's called Scorpions for Breakfast. <laughs> and by the way, the governor has agreed to sign her book for you after dinner um, right across the foyer here. But Sarah Palin wrote very admiringly about Governor Brewer and said, quote, like many of us, she was called to public life after first getting involved with the education of her children. I'm never surprised when I hear that a stint with the PTA or local school board helped bring someone into even more robust public service. School boards just seem to get the mama blood, the, get the political blood pumping in mama grizzlies, unquote. <laughs> After that, Governor Brewer ran and was elected to the Arizona House of Representatives and then the Arizona Senate, including four years as Senate Majority Whip. Following service in the state legislature, she was elected to two terms on the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, including two elections as board chairman. She was elected Arizona Secretary of State in 2002 and re-elected until serving uh, until January 2009 when Governor Napolitano joined the Obama administration and by as Arizona succession law, Jan Brewer became the governor. She is a consistent voice for the rights of states as part of her support for new federalism. And this was perhaps best illustr illustrated when she signed Senate Bill 1070 called Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhood Act as a tool to help secure Arizona's southern border, quickly dubbed America's toughest immigration law. It was a way to deal with a crisis in Arizona caused by drug dealers and human smugglers generic criminals, and the sheer volume of people pouring over Arizona's unsecured border. The illegal immigration problem had become so overwhelming for the law-abiding citizens of Arizona that they had to pass a law to protect themselves because the federal government wouldn't. Governor Brewer says illegal immigration mocks the law much the way our president mocks those he disagrees with on the issue. He makes fun of them, saying they want a moat with alligators in it around the country. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a feisty crowd here. Obama sued Governor Brewer for daring to try to make him do his job and enforce the law in America. And my all-time favorite photo of the governor and the president is on the back of the program where she's explaining this to the president. You know, from the way he's grabbing her arm and his eyes are downcast, I think he's trying to stop the explanation. <laughs> Governor Brewer has changed Arizona and our country for the better. She's made us stronger and more confident with her straightforward, honest, hard work and devotion to America's freedom. Please join me now in welcoming Arizona's Governor Jan Brewer. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much, and uh, good evening to everyone. It is absolutely an honor for me to be here this evening at the Reagan Ranch Center speaking to such a wonderful group of conservative women, all of you out here. We don't get those opportunities very much. And I will tell you, it has been a very special privilege for me to see firsthand uh, the work of the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute preparing conservative women of all ages for leadership roles throughout this great country. I know we can all agree that the conservative movement is especially blessed by the work of uh, 
Rebecca Clayfish and Donnie Darwish and Katie McFarlane and uh, Michelle Easton and certainly um, Congressman uh, Marsha Blackburn. I know she had to leave, but she's terrific too. And I am so honored, so honored uh, to be here with each and every one of them here tonight. It is uh, truly to all of you. Thank you for everything that you have done in our country. Because we're here tonight at the uh, Reagan Ranch Center, I hope you will allow me to share one of President Reagan's favorite stories. Uh, there was a traffic accident, and the victim was stretched out on the side of the road, and a crowd had gathered all around, and a man elbowed his way through the, uh, the crowd, and there was a woman bending down over the victim. And the man pushed her aside, saying, um, I've had training. I've had training in first aid, uh, let me take over. And she stepped back and he tried his best uh, doing a few of those things that he'd learned in that great first aid class. And the woman tapped him on the shoulder and uh, said, uh, when you get to that part about calling the doctor, I'm right here. <laughs> Yes, women are making great strides in this country. Indeed, women are running for political office in record numbers, and they're winning. I think it's important that we not take this kind of woman power for granted, either at the federal or state level. Conservative women who are getting elected to office are translating their successes into victory for all women. And women will continue to make positive strides by serving as role models for the younger generation. As Margaret Thatcher reminded us, if you want something said, ask a man. But if you want something done, ask a woman. Got that, girls. Those of us in public service have a responsibility to mentor one another. It's a responsibility that we inherited, and it's one that we can pass along to those who will come after us, including, I'm sure, many of you in this room tonight. You might know, especially if you've read my book, Scorpion for Breakfast, that the most important mentor in my life was my mother, Edna Drinkwine. You see, I know what it's like to be a single mom struggling to make ends meet while caring for your family. I saw my mother's face, uh, so many challenges, after my father died when I was 11 years old. She had never worked outside the home, but my mother knew that she had to support my brother and I. And with her meager savings, she bought a small dress shop, and I worked side by side with her until the time she sold it when I was 20 years old. That dress shop was really a classroom for me where I learned the importance of hard work, responsibility, honesty, integrity, and yes, courage from my mother's example. I needed that example. I followed that example as I faced challenges of my own when I became governor of Arizona. I say challenges because a former Democratic governor, Janet Napolitano, left Arizona for the Obama administration in the early uh, part of 2009, leaving her successor, that would be me, <laughs> the worst state budget deficit in the nation, worse than California per capita. <laughs> that was some great goodbye gift, wasn't it? You know, it was like arriving at the party, and it's over, and the waiter hands you the bill. <laughs> no one, no one could have known the mountains of challenges we face in rebuilding Arizona, but I never doubted our resolve to get the job done. My first official act as governor in 2009 was to issue a directive to state agencies calling for a freeze on all new state government regulations. Then, with a series of historic reforms, we lowered corporate taxes, we lowered capital gain taxes, we lowered corporate property taxes, and we lowered business person personal property taxes. How's that for dealing with a fiscal cliff? <laughs> but 
But you know, wait, there's more. We fundamentally changed the state's economic development model by establishing the Arizona Commerce Authority, aiming it and arming it with a board of directors comprised of Arizona's best minds in business and industry. We eliminated state agencies. We reduced personnel costs. And Arizona has gone from a $3 billion deficit to a balanced budget along with a cash carry forward and a $450 million in the state's rainy day fund. Meanwhile, education in Arizona is being transformed with reform initiatives that include new common core standards that are benchmarked to the top education measures in the world. I believe it's critical. We start funding the student achievement we want, rather than simply continuing to fund the system that we have. So I propose the nation's first comprehensive performance funding plan for our districts and charter schools, promoting school performance while maintaining local control. Meanwhile, the Arizona comeback is strengthened by a workforce that's one of the most efficient in the nation. We've added jobs all across our 11 major economic sectors, including the construction industry. Our housing market is recovering faster in Metro Phoenix than anywhere else in America. Arizona was recently ranked as the nation's best state for entrepreneurs, one of the top 10 for business owners, and Forbes magazine ranks us number two for business growth prospects. Thank you. In short, Arizona has created a model for economic recovery very different from the way the Obama administration views spreading the wealth around. Where they've chosen more regulations, we've chosen deregulation. Where they've spent, we saved. Where they handcuffed private industry, we've unleashed the free market. These reforms have been accomplished through basic Reagan conservative free market principles of competition, choice, public-private partnerships, and limited government regulation. And let me talk about Arizona security for a moment here. The Obama administration has failed us regarding immigration policy. They failed to protect our citizens. They failed to preserve the rule of law and they fail to secure our borders. Meanwhile, Arizona is bearing the brunt of those failures. Robert Krenz, a dedicated, community-minded man, was shot to death on the same Cochise ranch his family has called home for more than 100 years. A brave and noble Border Patrol agent, Agent Brian Terry, was murdered by a border gang, armed by our own federal government, an administration that allowed guns to be shipped into Mexico in the scandalous Fast and Furious operation. I prayed for strength and I prayed for our future before I signed Senate Bill 1070 to support our Law Enforcement and State Neighborhoods Act. I signed it because I firmly believed in what it represented and that it would be the best for Arizona. And the heart of Senate Bill 1070 has been unanimously vindicated by the highest court in the land. Arizona and every other state's inherent authority to protect and to defend its people has been upheld. You know, I sometimes wonder whether this struggle with the federal government will make us stronger, especially because now we fully understand what's at stake during the next four years. We fully understand what's right, and we understand what's wrong. Wrong is failing to secure our borders. 
wrong? It's taxpayers forced to bear the expenses of that failure, including the cost of state and federal prison cells overflowing with illegal alien felons. Wrong is Barack Obama accumulating more debt than any other president in history and then dumping it on the backs of our children and our grandchildren. Wrong is millions of Americans unemployed, millions more who cannot find enough work. So here's what I believe is right. Right is calling a terrorist, well, a terrorist. <laughs> Right is calling a Christmas tree a Christmas tree and calling a menorah a menorah. Right is not being ashamed to salute the flag, wear a flag pin, say the Pledge of Allegiance, or sing the national anthem with a tear in our eye. Right is working with all fair-minded people to reform our nation's immigration system by saying to those that are here illegally, sorry, no driver's licenses, no special privileges. And guess what? You'll have to get in line the way thousands of others have done, the right way, the legal way. With, with the various reform proposals now under consideration, I'm pleased that there is finally a recognition of what we've been saying in Arizona. Immigration reform will not succeed unless and until we have achieved an effective border security. And I am hopeful, thank you, thank you. I am hopeful that the immigration system is reformed in a manner that combines the rule of law and human compassion while strengthening the United States' competitive position in the world. And I remain committed to doing everything within my power to make certain our federal government finally upholds its obligation to secure America's borders. You know what should bother us the most is that we have a president who suggests that America is not an exceptional nation. What other country has sent its finest young women and men to fight on distant battlefields for justice and peace? What other nation has ever rose to such strength, yet rose not to conquer, but to protect? What other nation has acted not to dominate but to liberate. We are an exceptional nation. We are. That's just a fact written in the blood and the sacrifice of American patriots and their families. Not long ago, I had the rare honor of visiting our troops stationed in Kuwait and Afghanistan, and I met with our wounded warriors at Walter Reed. It was truly an incredible opportunity to be with our young men and women uh, in uniform and to be able to thank them personally for their service and their sacrifice, seeing firsthand their extraordinary courage and patriotism, their love for this country, and their commitment to freedom. It's something that will stay with me forever for the rest of my life. During this trip to Santa Barbara, I had the great privilege today of visiting the Reagan Ranch, a captivating place, so filled with Reagan's presence that you'd expect to see him walking hand in hand with Nancy from his ranch house out to the yard to greet you. And you know, his words are still with us. In his final radio address to the nation in 1989, he said, and I quote, 
whether we seek it or not, whether we like it or not, we Americans are the keeper of the miracles. We are asked to be guardians of a place to come to, a place to start again, a place to live in the dignity that God meant for his children. May it ever be so. End of quote. Yes, may it ever be so. From the shadow of our disappointment as we face another four years of Barack Obama, I believe there is reason to lift our hearts. Just look around this room. It's filled with dedicated, enthusiastic, smart, articulate, dedicated women, young and not so young, <laughs> dedicated to leading this country back to the principles of our founding fathers. I am honored to be able to stand with you this evening and say to all of you, as women united under the banner of Ronald Reagan, we will never ever rest until we have taken back our country, until we have restored once again it back to that shining city on the hill. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Your presence and talking to you all today has been a great blessing in my life. And it's all of you, young and old, that give you the courage and the encouragement to keep going, and I am so proud to be able to call you my comrades in the battle ahead. Thank you so much, and may God bless you and your families, and may God bless the fruits of the Western Women's Summit, and may God bless and protect the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What a great talk. I'm inspired. <laughs> you inspire me. Look at all the people you've inspired <laughs> and made possible. <laughs> And the governor has agreed to do a few questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, waiting for the mic and um, just giving your name and uh, I guess where you're from. Uh, Camille? Can you give me a, oh, here's the water. Oh, there you go. I said I would answer questions if you didn't make them tough. <laughs> uh, my name is Bruce Calder. I live in Santa Barbara. Uh, I have been a great admirer of yours, Governor Brewer. Thank you so much. And I was really amazed when my only newspaper that I have any faith in whatsoever ran an editorial criticizing you. And I wonder if you would answer that editorial, please. Well, I don't know which one you're talking about. <laughs> I don't want to get into problems here talking about one that you don't know about. Uh, <laughs> what newspaper? Uh, the Wall Street Journal. Okay, and, and the editorial? Was criticizing you for more or less gaming the system of Medicaid. Well, and, and I uh, was too disappointed in the Wall Street Journal. The fact of the matter is, is that I had to make a very tough decision. You all know that I was not a supporter of the Affordable Health Care Act, Obama Health Care, if you will. Um, I led the charge um, along with other governors, taking it to court, and we lost unfortunately. And you know, elections have consequences. The president was reelected and he controls the Senate. So as governor, as all governors have to do, they have to decide what is the best for their state. Arizona, I am very pleased to say, has the gold standard as far as cost containment and good care under Medicaid. We have a capitated 
program, unlike any other state in the country. And we didn't get into Medicaid early on. We got into it later. But we did it right. So our system is very, very cost effective. However, in Arizona, the voters have twice voted to expand Medicaid in the state of Arizona. And we respect the voters. Um, they pick out some good people sometimes. I, you know, I, I think they're pretty smart. So now we're faced uh, with what we are faced with, with, with the Affordable Health Care Act. So I had to determine what was the best for the people of Arizona. If we move forward, and if the legislature agrees, what will happen is that we will receive $2 billion into our economy, into the state of Arizona. It will not cost the taxpayers of the state of Arizona a penny. That allows us to be able to do the necessary things that I think are important, since we've already cut $3 billion out of our budget in the last two years, doing that in one year, by the way, to fund education, which is a number one priority for the people in Arizona. And if we didn't accept those dollars, the bottom line is, is that it wouldn't do anything to help with the federal deficit. It would just go to another state. So do the math. What are you going to do? You know, they're going to give me back into the state of Arizona to deliver health care services that the electorate has already voted for twice that they wanted to be provided, receive that money, deliver those services, and then knowing that we can have that money to deliver what we believe are the important essential things to improve our economy and get a well-rounded, educated workforce so we can bring lots of businesses into Arizona and support our university systems. So they said that they are going to match those dollars uh, nine to one. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. I don't know if we can trust the federal government. I have my doubts. <laughs> But I put a circuit breaker in there that if they try to do a bait and switch, then it comes back to the table and whomever is in power at that time, whether it be two years, three years, four years, they can bring it back and they can say, go away. We're not going to do it. We can't afford it. It's the wrong thing. But in the meantime, I believe strongly that it is the right thing to do for the state of Arizona. And when I look at the people that I've been speaking to in Arizona and what is going to affect so many different states is that our rural hospitals in Arizona are paying so much uncompensated care. And if they don't get that compensated care paid for, they will close down. And in Arizona, rural Arizona is very, very important, but it's one of the biggest job uh, uh, employers in, in the state. So, you know, it, it just when you put the numbers down, you do the math, it is the right thing to do. Do we like a, 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 the Affordable Care Act? Absolutely not. Are we going to cut off our nose and spite my face? It, 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 it's just not. It's, it's irresponsible, absolutely irresponsible in Arizona. Am I going to take my citizens' tax dollars and let them go to California? Or am, <laughs> am I going to let my taxpayers' dollars go to New York, where last year their fraud bill alone, $10 billion in fines, that's more than my Medicaid whole program is. Um, I will tell you, I'm traveling to Washington, D.C. We are going to speak to a lot of Congress people there, senators and representatives, and we're going to talk about Arizona's plan because I can tell you, if the other states would adopt our access program and do it on a capitated um, method, we would save our country billions of dollars. And we have been requested by states all over this country to come out and present to them personally. They've come into our state. So I, um, I believe that uh, we can do this. I think that we can make sure that the federal government doesn't renege on us. And I'm not going to take my taxpayers' hard-earned dollars and um, send it out uh, to California or New York or, or, or wherever, especially with the 
voting populace there who had voted twice to expand it. And the circuit breaker says, okay, federal government, you're not going to do bait and switch. And if you do, it's back on the table. And I can tell you, I've already done that. I put a freeze on Medicaid, and I was called every nasty name in the book because I knew I had to do it. I will always, I will always do what I think is right. And I think that um, what I've done today, uh, moving forward uh, with our Medicaid uh, uh, decision, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to pass. I think that it is. When anybody sits down and they do the math and the jobs and, and figure it out, um, I think we will get it through the legislature. But I believe strongly that it is the right uh, thing for Arizona. This is Thank the last you. question. Well, we're almost out of time now. Well, you come oh. out of the uh, Thank you. barn really uh, quick with a toughie there. Uh, Governor, thank you for being here tonight. I don't know where you're I'm at. Way back oh, here. there you are. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, if the communists run Hillary in 2016, will you run against her? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope that um, Hillary does run because I think after four years of uh, the Obama administration, we just will know that the country is just not going to stand for any more of that malarkey. And um, I just um, know that we have a big job to do. And we all know, as I said earlier, elections have consequences. We, as a band of warriors, need to get out there, tell our message, get organized, and make sure that we get a good Republican uh, elected uh, to the President of the United States and save our country. And I'll support that person in any way that I can. Was that the final? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I keep looking for that easy one. Well, thank you. What thank a, you. What a wonderful talk. We're just so delighted you come. Thank you so and very join much. Us to finish our summit. And uh, we hope you'll come back. I'll be back. And thank you all, all you ladies here that do your job. And thank you, people that support your organization. And thank you for your wonderful endowment. You know, as I said in my speech, I want you to know mentoring is so, so important. we got to bring you up and send you out into the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much.